Lord, inshallah. So, Sheikh Omar is going to show me suddenly why it's in the Amri. Wahlu al-Uqa datan bil lisani yafkahu qawli. Allahumma alim al-haqqa haqqa wa zuhna qiba wa alim al-baratila baratila wa zuhna jtinaba. Amin ya Rabbi. So, today I want to first talk, I want to give a template of what is a normal relationship. And then I will proceed after that. So let me first start by mentioning, they did these studies, right? In which they looked at how boys, little boys, like, you know, seven years old, eight years old, when their boys are in their natural state, how they talk. They got all these monologues of looking at boys talk. And then they got all these monologues of girls at young age, how they talk. Keep this in mind as I move forward. Now, what is a normal relationship between a husband and a wife? It is always the wife. Let me put it this way. That, you know the Prophet ﷺ, was he the one seeing the problems or his wives were seeing the problems? In the relationship of husband and wife. The wife. That's their job. The job of the wife is to point out the problems and the issues of the world, or in her house, in her situation, okay? And this is very important because, you see, girls want to communicate. And whenever there's a conflict between the husband and the wife, what do generally the guys do as a response? She wants to say something, and the guy's sisters will try not to engage. Do you know why they will not try to engage? Because they feel like if I told them what I really feel like, what will happen? It'll create a bigger conflict, so it's better to stay quiet. The wife wants to communicate, and the guy will say, if I communicate, it's gonna make a bigger problem. So the guys don't communicate. That's actually the wrong response from the guy's side. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is maybe a more proper, a more sunnah-oriented response. Because the Prophet ﷺ always engaged his wife, even in difficult conversations. To not engage your wife will just get them more upset, and they'll try to engage with you even what? Huh? More. If you don't talk to your wife, and she's upset, she's going to talk to you what? More. And you're going to be, and then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to try to ignore the conversation. And you're going to be forced to talk to her at some point. So it's better to be prepared to talk to her from the very beginning. Number one. Number two, this is very important, that women, guys, sisters, I want you to know this about men, guys are goal-oriented. So for example, let's take a scenario. The wife has a flat tire. She calls her husband. She says, I have a flat tire. Guess what's the first thing a guy will do? All these guys, they're all thinking the same thing. They're all thinking we're gonna tell our wife to open the trunk, take out the tire, and how to fix the tire. Isn't that what you're all thinking? Yeah. What else is there? That's not what they want to hear first. That's not what they want to hear is, oh, I'm so sorry that you're suffering. I am so sorry that you have to go through this. That's the, the first thing a wife wants is an emotional connection. And it is so amazing from the Quran that when I look at the Quran from this perspective, these studies that have been done on this issue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks directly to two women in the Quran, the mother of Musa and Maryam. And Maryam. What is the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Mariam? Now Allah wants Mariam to do something, which is to move the trunk of the tree. But what does He tell her before that? And Allah only did this in the whole Qur'an only for women. Allah tahzani, don't be sad. That's the first thing Allah said. Allah made an emotional connection with women before telling them move the tree. Right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing the heart of the mother of Musa والسلام, when he describes her, Musa She found her heart empty. 
What is the first thing Allah tells her? Allah wants to tell her, when you see that the army is coming to kill Musa, put Musa in the, where? In the river. What does Allah tell her before that? Allah ta'zani, don't be sad. Don't be sad. It's the first thing Allah does. So the first thing Allah does with women in Quran, when Allah is talking, because when Allah talks directly to the men, Allah tells them, okay, this is what I want you to do. Ya yuhal muzambir, boom. Ya yuhal mudassir, ya yuhal mudassir, boom. Right? Ya da'uda inna ja'annaka khalifatan fil ard. Ya adam, uskun anta wa zawtuka jannah. Wa kula min harakadan haythu shi'tubah. So the, when Allah talks to the men, it's like, more like, do this. This is what I want you to do. This is what I expect from you, from you to do. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the women, what is his methodology? He first makes an emotional connection to the women. Right? He first makes an emotional connection to the women and then tells them what to do. Guys are goal-oriented. And because they're goal-oriented, whenever a wife brings up a problem, what do the guys do? They give the solution to the problem. But actually, what do women need before even the solution? They need what? An emotional assurance. An emotional what? Assurance. Because, let me say this as a side note, what's the most important uh, need? I'm using the word need. What is the most important need for men in a relationship of husband and wife? Tell me. What's the most important need? More important than love. Respect. Respect. What is the most important need of a, of a wife in a relationship? She wants to feel that she's understood. She wants to feel that she's appreciated. She wants to feel that my husband understands me, he gets me. That we're on the same vibe, that when I'm having a difficult day, he knows it. You know, this is the thing, that women expect men to understand them without them telling the men what they're, what? Right? And the Prophet was actually able to do it. Because the Prophet said to Aisha, I know when you're what? Upset with me. When you're upset with me, you say by the rab of? Ibrahim. And when you're not upset with me, you say by the rab of? Now most guys, 99% of us, will, would never be able to do that. To know that my wife is actually upset. Right? Until things go to a boiling point where then she shows that she's upset. But the Prophet was able to enter the room and have a small conversation and be able to feel he was able to magically read her mind, so to say, because this is what, why do women always insist on, you should just already know. You should already know that I was feeling this way. You should have already known that I was upset. You should have already known that I was tired. Why do women say that? They say that because they want to feel that my husband understands me, he gets me. He can read me. So the most important emotion for men is what? Respect. So that's for the sisters. Right? And for the brothers is the most important emotion from the brother's perspective of, his, of your wife is that your wife has to feel what? My husband understands me. He gets me. But you're not going to understand her unless you're not unless you're what? You're actually understanding her. You're spending time with her. You're actually talking to her. Right? And I'm going to like mention um, quickly I'll mention a few things and hopefully uh, my brain is not going to be too scattered uh, as I talk about this. Alright, Allah will say So, two children are in the playground. They start fighting. And you see, oh, these two kids are in the playground, they're fighting. 30 minutes later, those two kids are doing what? Play. Why? Forget. Why do they choose playing over fighting? Because they choose happiness over who's right. They choose what? Good couples. That's the good couple. That's like the couple like me and my wife. Okay, the good couple. We get stuck in what? We get stuck in who's right, who's wrong. You're right and I'm 
wrong, or I'm wrong, or, or she'll say you're wrong and I'm right. But what should be the attitude is what? Is it, who cares who's right and who's wrong? Right? The attitude should be what? Happiness is more important than what? Who's right and who's wrong. If you don't do that, sometimes things like that can become a barrier between you and you understanding your wife. Or the wife respecting the husband. Okay, so now let me go back to what I was talking about, the monologue of the kids. So they did these studies in which they were looking at how boys talk to each other, right? Because, and why I found this interesting, particularly me, because it seemed to fit with the Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, ethos, the Islamic view of the world, and the Islamic view of mankind. And also because when people are children, they're on fitra, they're closer to nature. So if you study little girls, how they talk, and if you study little boys, how they talk, it'll give you an insight to something very deep about human nature. Uh, before I tell you about this study, I'll tell you about another study that I think is very important. Uh, they, one of the top 50 studies that they ever did in the field of psychology, the top 50 studies, was that they gave trucks in cars to uh, the girls. And what were they expecting the girls to do? Take the trucks and the cars and to do what do the little boys do? Trucks and cars. Smash them, right? That's what they do. And they gave dolls to who? To the boys. Do you know what happened? The boys took the dolls and started smashing them to each other. And the girls took the trucks and made them into their, what? Babies. I'll remind you of a narration of the Prophet The Prophet enters the house of Abu Bakr. And he says to Aisha, what is this? And she said, these are babies. Because she was, what, playing with them? Babies. And in amongst the babies, there was a horse with the wings, two wings. And the Prophet said, what is this? And she said, don't you know? This is the horse of what? Suleiman. Even though that's wrong, but the Prophet didn't correct her, by the way. That was, I don't want to go into that right now. But the Prophet said, oh, that's interesting. He was able to come down at her level and look at things from her perspective. But I was talking about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, if you even give a group of girls, cars, what will they do with it? Make it into babies. You cannot, and sorry, I have to say this because one of the biggest enemies I have in my life is the concept of liberalism and what it stands for, okay? You cannot run away from your anatomy. You cannot run away from your biology. You cannot run away from your hormones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has little girls pretending that they're having babies and growing babies when they're still babies themselves for a future what? For a future time. It's embedded. And guys, they're embedded to behave differently too. You give them a bunch of dolls, what are they gonna do? Smash them. Because that's what men do. They defend their territory. They establish their territory. They get ready for wars, so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this system in place since we, since our childhood. We're, we are caged in this. You cannot run away from it. You can't run away. See, I find it as a big, big problem when people think they can run away from their biology and become something outside their autonomy, the, 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 their own biology. It's not possible. Yeah, of course, nowadays they'll take medicine and change and so on and so forth. It's a separate issue. But let me come back to where we were. Now, when they studied a bunch of boys in these monologues, and they studied a bunch of girls in these monologues, what did they find? What is the first sign amongst the girls? Sisters, you should try to remember when you were really young. What was the first sign of friendship amongst little girls? What's the first sign of friendship amongst little girls? You know what it was? It was putting their hands into the ears of their girlfriend and telling her a secret. Do you ever remember that? 
Because girls like to share. Girls what? And they love to share communication, and they like to share secrets. For them, that's what it means to be a best friend. For them, to me, the best friend means that I can tell her, or I can tell him, meaning my husband, my what? My secrets. That's really fun for girls. Okay? What's the thing about boys? Now, I'm going to give you one monologue, a reading of a monologue for the boys, so it becomes clear. So, three boys, four boys are sitting together, and they're talking to each other. So one boy says, I can kick the ball to the roof of the school. And the second boy, boy, boy says, I can kick the ball to the sky. And the third boy says, I can kick the ball to God. What does this tell you about the nature, the fitra of men, the boys? They're competitive, right? They think in hierarchy. This is why it's, I'll give you an example, okay? When a wife says to her husband, vacuum the house. What? Vacuum the house. Now the husband has to convince himself, this is my idea, because he has to, because guys think in hierarchies, right? So I'm the boss, so why is she telling me what to do? Girls, this is true, okay? So I'm gonna tell you a very big thing here. Girls think in terms of sharing. Guys think in terms of hierarchy. The girl says to the guy, vacuum the house. Mom says to the son, vacuum the house. Wife says to the husband, vacuum the house. The husband needs about 15 minutes to convince himself that this is his idea. <laughs> but if within 15 minutes you say to him again, vacuum the house, guess what happens? He has to start over again. Because he has to convince himself, it's my idea. So this, the guys are raised biologically, chemically, to, to think in terms of hierarchy. That's how guys are. And so please, sisters, before you tell your husband to do the same thing again, wait at least 20 minutes, okay? All right, now what else? What we learned in this monologue of the boys is that they are competitive and they think in hierarchy. So I'll give you another example. Wife says, I have a headache. Husband's gonna, oh no, sorry, I said it wrong. And actually this happened between the prophet and Aisha also, towards the end of his life. The husband says to his wife, I have a headache. The wife says, because wives like to do what did I say? Share. She says to her husband, can I share this with you? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, that. wife comes home, she says, I have a headache. No, sorry. Husband comes home, he says, I have a headache. What do wives do? They like to what? Sure, just remember this. But guys think in what? Higher? Sorry. So now, the husband comes home, he says, I have a headache. The wife also says, I have a headache. What is the guy going to think? She's nullifying my... She's trying to put one over me. Because I got a headache, so she said, what? So that means your headache is okay, it doesn't matter. That's how... Who will read that? Guys. How will girls read it? I'm just sharing. I'm just sharing. We had something in common. I'm just sharing. So, there's another thing the Prophet ﷺ said very beautifully in describing the nature of the women and their communication. And that is that women generally, not all the time, because they're, just as there's many different types of men, there are many different types of women, so it's Important to generalize, you know, where people say, don't generalize. No, it's important to generalize because without generalizing, you can't come to an understanding. But generally, the Prophet, let me say what the Prophet said. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet said that the women are curved or that they're bent. 
their ribs are bent, right? And don't try to break, don't try to straighten the rib because it will what? Break, number one. And the prophet said that the most curved is the upper part of the rib. What does it mean? What the prophet is alluding to is that women communicate differently than men. And you have to understand that. And you should not change your wife from being who she is to something else because if you do force it, what will happen? She'll break. She cannot become a man for you. She wants you to understand her mystically. And she wants you to understand her without saying things directly to you. This is what it means that when awrach means curved. You know how women are curved? A lot created women in a curve, right? You get that, right? So their their conversation is sometimes curved. If your wife says to you, would you like to have an ice cream? What is she really saying? She's saying, I want an ice cream. <laughs> right? So they don't necessarily say things in the same way guys say things. And this is one of the things that the Prophet is alluding to because the guy gets frustrated and tells, look, if you have something in your mind, say it directly to me. But he's asking her to become more like a man, and that's not good. If you do that, you'll break her. You can't expect her to be like, that's where the attraction is. The attraction is there because men are men, women are women. Now, let's move forward. What did I say so far so that I have uh, my thoughts aligned? I talked about how, what's the general framework, right? Generally, the wife, you like to call it emotional. Okay, we call it emotional. I, I think of it in a different way because it's all happening in the brain. Logic is in the brain and emotions are also in the, in the brain. So emotion is a form of logic, by the way. Emotion is a form of logic. Because if there was a bullet shooting at you and you were to logically think about, okay, what should I do? You'll be dead by the time you come to an answer. So emotions are themselves a form of thinking. Anyway, I don't want to go into that right now. So the women have a different form of thinking. Men have a different form of thinking. That's what I was trying to say. So in a conflict between the husband and the wife, in a conflict, the wife wants to do what? What did I say girls like to do? Share. And they like to say, well, this is not done, and this is not done, and this is not done. They are what? Sharing. You, she wants you to do what? Share back. But what do guys do, generally speaking, when the wife comes after you and says, give me what, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, the guys are gonna do what? They're gonna shut down. And by the way, stonewalling, which is a form of shutting down, when you don't talk to your wife for long periods of time, this is a form of abuse. This is a form of abuse. Because you're like, oh, I'm just not gonna engage with you. Well, if you don't engage her, that's her biggest need. Her biggest need is to get what? Is to get the engagement from the husband. And so this is what I generally tell couples. So I, let me just come back to some practical things. I tell couples, that try to keep things, everything positive throughout the day. But have a certain time, a slot, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, you know, whatever it is, where you can talk about all the negative things you want. But it's only in that what? Only in that time. And when a sister wants to nag a husband, she has five minutes. You want to yell at your husband? Okay, start the timer, you got five minutes. <laughs> but if you keep it going, it's gonna create a negative situation in the house. So you want to, you want the emotions to come out, but you also want to keep things what? Balance, okay? So like if there's couples and they have a certain issue, um, let me give an example. Um, I'll give one example. So let's say there's a husband and wife, the husband cheated on the wife, okay? And what's the, what's the, what does the wife want to do now? She wants to what? She wants to talk about why this happened. Like, why did you cheat on me? But if she talks about that the whole day, what will happen? Will the relationship get healed? Probably not. But if you, but she has to what? She has to communicate. She has to talk. 
Just let out your feelings. So you have to give a certain time. Okay, every day, one hour, talk about only this subject until you feel like you've asked all the questions because you have to heal yourself. So my point is that it's a good uh, strategy for husbands and wives to have a time every day where you can say to your wife, or your wife can say to you, okay, it's time now for us to bring out all the issues of the day. But the rest of the day, you have to be what? Positive. Because there are four killers of a marriage. Okay, so let me talk about the four things that kill every marriage. The first thing is criticism. In marriage, there's no such thing as positive criticism. What did I just say, sisters? There is no such thing as positive criticism in a marriage. Criticism, because you're hurting the ego of your husband. And guys have a very, very sensitive ego. Okay. Guys have probably, in a way, maybe a lot of guys physically stronger, but their egos are weaker than women in many ways. So, if guys feel they're being criticized, they're going to shut down. What's the second killer of it? Oh, and also, the other way around, if the guy is criticizing the wife, how will the wife feel? What's the most important need of the wife? To feel understood. If a man is always criticizing his wife, is she going to feel understood? Is she going to feel like my husband understands me? No. Like he, doesn't, he doesn't get me at all. We have two separate lives. And by the way, let me mention that. A very, very important. I like to say this wherever I go. I think it's extremely, extremely important. I say this wherever I go because it's so, so important in this time of alienation. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Adam alayhi salatu wa salam, Ya Adam, O oh Adam. Now he's the first man. And he has the first wife. And Allah is going to talk to him, giving him a command, the first command in Quran to Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. Ya Adam uskun anta wa zawjukal jannah. And do what? You live in Jannah and do what? Wa And eat from it. Raghadan haythu shaktuma. As much as you like, eat from Jannah. What do people do? What do husbands and, or people that are dating each other, what do they do when they want to get to know each other? They go for what? Food. Eat together. Because when you eat, eating together is not just a biological phenomenon. Eating together is a bonding social phenomenon. Not just between the husband and wife, but between the whole family. Because when the father sits in his chair, and the mother sits in her chair, and the children are all sitting in there, you are reinforcing the value system of your family. You're what? In for, it is a, such a big, and if there's anything that I want any of you to do after this lecture of mine, is that you must eat as a family. It is not acceptable that the wife comes and she gets her pizza, and the husband comes and gets his uh, biryani, and uh, the children come and get their own food, and they all microwave it, they all eat separately. This is not a healthy family. This is not healthy uh, bonding of a family. And then you don't even know if your children have problems now because you don't see them every day. You don't eat with them every day. So whether you do it every day, every other day, once a week, but you have to eat together. And number two, when you think, do you think that when Adam and Eve, uh, Hubba were eating in Jannah, right? Were they talking about their bills? Oh, we have this bill. Oh, you didn't throw out the garbage today. Is that what they were discussing? Were they talking about their chores? What were they talking about? Everything else other than anything related to stress. You're enjoying food. Allah gave you taste buds, right? So that everything you eat is more delicious because of the taste buds you have. So you can enjoy your food. If you're enjoying your food, enjoy the conversation. That's you know, that's why they take, when they have big businesses, what do they do? They take you to wine and dine 
to make you feel good, give you good food, right? Make you feel satisfied, right? Complete one of your needs, your biological needs, so that you can then say yes and sign the contract of the big business. When you eat together as husband and wife, you should not be, and, and also with children, if the only relationship you have with your son is to say, did you do your homework? That's not a relationship. If the only question you have for your wife is, kind of an onion, you made the food? That's not a relationship. And unfortunately, that's what we are doing. Our conversations as life moves on, as life moves on, our, life, our conversations become conversations of urgencies and conversations of stress and conversations of employer-employee relationship. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Achab, you finished homework? Shabbat shalom, so job. Right? That's not a relationship. Do you know what his favorite colors are? Do you know what, he's, what happened at school today? Do you know his best friends? Do you know her best friends? Your wife's best friends? Do you know if she had a good day today? Do you know if she had a bad day today? If you don't know on a day-to-day -day basis what your wife is going through, and vice versa, if the wife doesn't know on a day-to-day -day basis what the husband is going through, outside the questions of urgency and outside the questions of stress, what made you happy today? What made you upset today? If you don't have those conversations, you really don't have a relationship. You have a failing relationship. And your children are learning what? Your children are also learning that the only conversation a family has is, did you do your homework? And your children are learning that the only conversation it means to be a dad is to ask, did you get a good grade in math? In your, how's your math exam? That's not a relationship. When we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu being praying and Hassan and Hussein playing over him, that's a relationship. When we read that the Prophet ﷺ used to kiss his wives before every prayer, that's a relationship. Right? Yeah. The Prophet came home sometimes and he would say, is there any food today? Oh, there's no food? Okay, I'll just fast. Sometimes he would ask if there's food. Sometimes you have to have those necessary conversations, but they should be less than, listen to what I'm saying, the necessary conversations, like, did you do your homework? Did you get a good grade? Are you doing good in school? You know, did you take the kids to the doctor? Except that should be less than 20% of your conversation with each other. Less than 20% of your conversations with each other. Now, where do you start? How much time do I have? Uh, another 10 to 12 minutes. 10 to 12 minutes, okay. <clears throat> so I was saying that there are four things that kill marriage. Uh, before I come to that, no, okay, let me go over this. So number one was what? I only mentioned one. Criticism. If you criticize your wife, and by the way, for anything you say negative, you should follow every bad deed by a good deed. That's what the Prophet said, some lies. Statistics tell us that you should follow every negative word with five good positive words. Because people don't forget the negative things, they forget the positive things. So the things that are good in your marriage, you don't remember. And the things that are bad in your marriage, it's hard to what? Forget. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perhaps said, Asa an tuhibu. Shay'an wa huwa Perhaps there's something you love but it's bad for you and perhaps taqra'ahu shay'an You dislike something but it is what? Khayr Because so that you force yourself to think in that direction Because it's easy for me to remember all the things that are negative that happen in my relationship But it's harder for me to remember all the positive things in my what? So I have to make an effort you have to, and I have to, and we all have to make an effort not to, to be thankful, to look at the positive. They did this big uh, study on when do women, 
this was a study on women, when do women tend to cheat on their husbands, which is a very big growing phenomenon now, and especially in the West, as you know. So when do women cheat on their husbands? You know what's the first thing? When the wife begins to compare her husband with other people. And when the wife becomes not, she doesn't see the good he does, she only sees the bad he does. And the truth is probably the other way. If the, because the Quran says, Maybe, if you, you have to, when you're in marriage, you have to look at the positive aspects and you should never compare your husband with another, what? Man. And you should never compare your wife with another, what? That is, in some way, a very disrespectful thing to do on both sides. Well, sometimes wives will be arguing with their husband when they come to me in counseling, and she said, well, the, the, our neighbors do it. Your best friend does it. That has nothing to do with this marriage. Every marriage is different. Every marriage has its own chemistry. And you can never compare one marriage to another marriage. It's impossible. Every marriage is completely different. There are many reasons for that, which I can't go into. So the first is criticism. The second, which is the result of a lot of criticism, is condescending, condescending <laughs> attitude. When you look down on your wife, like, oh, she's nothing. I don't, uh, my wife, she does nothing for me. Or my husband does nothing for me. And unfortunately, there's a side point to this that I want to talk about, which is that we live in an age that sometimes, sometimes to some level, with the young kids. Let me start, because I have a few minutes left. I want to say some things. I won't finish off on the four killers of a marriage, but let me mention this, of what I've seen of the cultural Islamic, uh, Muslim cultural landscape in marriages, okay? And that is that Muslim men and women tend to get married either if they're religious minded in their MSA years, early on. And if they don't get married in their early years, or you got married back home, but either you get married in your early years, in your MSA years, or if you are a brother or a sister and you got involved in your career, then sisters don't get married till their 30s and 40s and same with the brothers. Okay? And so this is what is happening is that when people actually finish their studies, their bachelors and their masters, if you've gone to that time, actually that point is the time where very few marriages happen. Because as soon as somebody has some amount of money, what's the first thing men do and women do? They'll get a house, now they got their mortgage, they get busy in their career. And so this is the trend we're seeing, either they get married young, or they get married in their 30s and what? And both of these could be a negative thing. It's a very, especially the other one, where you get married in your 30s and 40s, is a very bad trend that we have in the Muslim community. It's a very bad trend. Because the Sharia was, the maqasid of the Sharia is to make marriage as easy as possible. And so this is where the parents have to make some sort of sacrifice. What I suggest to parents, and we can open up this for discussion, is that let your son and some daughter get married. Have nikah, let him go through school. Let her go through school. The parents are taking care of her anyway, and the, the parents are taking care of him anyway. Let them get married. At least their eyes will not be running around, what, while they're in school. There'll be two people, young people, committed to each other. The other big problem we have that I want to talk more about because this deserves a whole lecture, there are five basic reasonings behind this, but what's happening with the brothers, the young upcoming brothers, the, the ones that are in their, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, these, they want to get married, but they're completely unmotivated. We have a phenomenon where men can't keep their jobs. We have a phenomenon where guys don't feel ambitious compared to the sisters. 
and the sisters are much more mature at a younger age. So if you have a 19-year-old boy and you have a 19-year-old girl, the tendency is the girl at 19 is more mature than the boy at what? But Islam wants you to get married early, but the problem is she's more mature than the, than the, than the husband. And the husband's fooling around with his friends and she's waiting at home like, okay, wait, we were supposed to do something important. So you have unmotivated boys who are not marriage material right now, a lot of them. And you have girls, what's the problem that the girls are facing is that they're on the edge. What do I mean by that? They have a certain stress level that's unprecedented. They think that if they get in any relationship, it's not going to work. They come into a relationship with the attitude like, oh, my marriage will be like my parents and my parents' marriage wasn't so good, so therefore I'm doomed. I, you know, I can go further on this, but girls are on the edge and girls are more successful. Girls are more successful in career. Girls are more mature, more earlier. Guys are unmotivated. Their grades aren't as good. They don't want to pursue uh, studies and, and careers in their lives. They're just not motivated. And this is a big problem because on the one side, marriage is a need. It's a need. It's a biological need people have. But then if these people that are unmotivated get married, what's going to happen? There's going to be a very clear result. And on the other side, we need the process of the Sharia is to get people married as soon as possible. So we're in a very difficult situation as far as this next generation that's coming up. So I'll end here. I think this is my time is up now. Uh, so I'll take questions and answers, and I'll try to answer them as good as I can, inshallah. Yeah. What are the more killers of marriage? Oh, okay. So there's criticism, condescending, sarcasm, and stonewalling. Stonewalling is when you say, I'm not going to talk to you. You don't want to do what I said, I'm just not going to talk to you. It's helping to walk away and come back and talk. You walk away to come back and talk. You don't walk away to not talk at all. That's killing the marriage. What's the second one? Uh, criticism, condescending, sarcasm. Looking down upon someone, belittling them. This is when the name calling starts. You're be this, and you're this, and you're that. Sarcasm. Sarcasm is when you make fun of them. Oh, this is food? This is worse than McDonald's food. <laughs> Yeah, someone asked me to ask you a question. Okay. So, he said, Mama, I want to get married. How do I proceed? You tell, well, this is what I used to tell kids. <laughs> if it's a brother or a sister, you tell your parents, look, if you don't help me get married, I'm going to do zina. <laughs> <laughs> why do we get married? Tell me why we get married. So that we don't do what? Zin. If somebody is prevent, if you are mature and you can hold the job, okay? Imam Shafi has the condition you can provide for her for one day. So if you can provide for her, you can hold the job. And you know a girl that's willing to marry you and take that risk. Every marriage is a risk. There's no bullet, there's no bulletproof from a marriage that won't have divorce. The Sahaba had divorce. And a lot of them. But every marriage is a gamble. If she's willing to take a gamble with you, then I don't I think we should look for all ways possible to make it work. And by the way, I will tell the older parents, older parents, if your daughter comes to you and says to you that I know a boy and I like him and I'm gonna marry him and you can't stop me. I'm sure all of us have seen cases like this, where the boys and the girls have decided we're getting married, and it doesn't matter what the parents say, what's going to happen. They're, I'm going to tell you, majority of the time, the parents are going to lose. So what should you do? 
You should take control by saying yes. Let me, meet, let me meet him and her, and let me meet their parents. And when you meet their parents, you can set your conditions. Okay, you can marry her when you finish this school, and when you finish this, and when you finish that. And if he happens to meet those conditions, then okay. You're in a more powerful position if you go with the flow. Because in this time and age, you're not in this place, you're not going to win your kids. And the reason for that is because of some, a big topic I didn't get a chance to talk about, alienation. Right? Everyone's in. Parents, husband knows nothing about the life of his wife. And the wife knows nothing about the life of her husband. And the older brother knows nothing about the life of his younger brother. And the younger brother has no idea about the life of his sister. They come home, they go into their rooms, they shut their rooms. Everyone's living, they're living together, but they're not together. They're alienated. And now that kid one day comes to you and says, oh yeah, by the way, I'm marrying that girl. What can you do now? You have no emotional relationship. He's not even mad that you'll be mad. He's mad that why are you objecting? Or she's mad that why are you mad? So unless you remove this problem of alienation, we are in a very difficult spot. Okay, I think I answered. Right? Did I answer the question? Yeah. Yes, brother. Is there like a perfect age or something to get married? How long is the neighborhood? <laughs> Uh, 24, 25, because the prophet did, but I don't have a really proper answer for that. I mean, they say maturity, but can you define maturity? Oh, yes, let me define maturity. So, dear parents, you need to work on the maturity of your kids. Okay? What is that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines maturity in Surah An Nisa. Allah said, Please correct me, I, I'm remembering the words, but they're not. وَلَا تُؤْتُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ سُفْحَا The mature person is the one who knows how to deal with money. The mature person is not the person if you gave him $10, and the next thing you know is that what? It's gone. The mature person is not the one who has $500 as their paycheck every week, and the next thing you know that it's what? All gone. That's not a mature person. The mature person is the one who knows how to save money. It's called abstinence. Abstinence is abstinence, whether it is in terms of your biology or money. If you can't save money, you don't know how to control money. You don't know how to use money. Then Allah says, don't give people like that money because they're dummies. So, the person who doesn't know how to use money should not get married. Because you know what will happen? I'll tell you what will happen. He's gonna get married, and he's young, and she's young. And the husband and wife made a plan that we're saving money to go on our honeymoon or our vacation. But one day, because he was at the mall, and he saw some golf, uh, what is it called, the sticks? The golf clubs, yes. He saw a bunch of golf clubs. He's like, oh, these are really cool, let me buy them. He comes home with the golf clubs and the wife's like, what did you just do? Right? You didn't even ask me. And then a lot of times what will happen is, the wife will find out that he actually dipped into her account to pay for those golf clubs. <laughs> that person should not get married. The person who does not know how to use money should never get married. But if he's 19 years old, and he knows how to save money, and he knows how to keep a job, and he's emotionally intelligent. He, he doesn't say I'm gonna quit my job because my boss just got upset with me. Then maybe that person can get married. Yes, brother. Uh, uh, I was wondering from your experience in going around the communities, what do other communities do as a community base to facilitate marriage for those who are basically not able to, or doesn't know how to, is there any program or 
committees or things that other communities have been doing and successful that you can share with us? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, the brother asked, what do communities, other communities do to facilitate marriages? And my answer is nothing. Now, this is what happens. I'll tell you why. Okay? I don't know if this is in, uh, if this is specific to the Desi community, but this is what happens. No one wants to marry their daughter or their son to the people in the community. So I get calls from New Jersey or from wherever. Can you find someone for my daughter? There's no one good in our community. Really? They're all the same everywhere. <laughs> I mean, there's no difference. You know, if you take 10 people from this community and 10 people from the Chicago community and 10 people from the New Jersey community, you're gonna get the same average, right? All things being said. But no one wants to marry somebody in their own community. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because we're embarrassed of ourselves. We're embarrassed of ourselves. And we're not open about our problems. And we're not open about the, re the things that we're all, every family now has problems. There's not one family that doesn't have problems. Every family is suffering something. Every family knows about other people that are in their family suffering. But we're just not being honest and we're not having honest conversation with each other. And so let me marry my daughter to somebody that they won't know her and you know, he'll, it's like a fresh start. My daughter needs a fresh start. But there's no fresh start because we live in a very globalized world. Everything is interconnected. Yes, but How do I find a wife? How do you find a wife? So one good thing is the internet. If you, as long as you have a good filtering system, if you're busy, right? If you're, like, there are different ways, right? So ideal is, you know a brother, and you and that brother and his sister or your mom or your dad, they can help you. Now, this is one of the problems between the, the pre-modern and the post-modern. Pre-modern, the parents knew more people than the kids. So if I was the dad, living in my village, let's say in Pakistan, right? I'm living in my village, I have my sons. I know more people than who, than my, I know more people than my kids. I know this village, I know that village, I know the village in the other city, I know the people in this place, I know more people than my children, I can get them married. Now what the problem is, after the post, in this postmodern world, the problem is the kids generally know more people than the parents, and the kids don't trust the parents. And there's other issues. And by the way, I want to make this statement so it's very clear. In, to me, it is a sin to marry a Christian white girl when there are Muslim girls that need to get married. And don't tell me, don't tell me that the girl that works in McDonald's is a good Christian. What do I mean by that? She doesn't go to church, she's not chaste, she's had boyfriends before, and you're gonna say, oh, this is the Ahlul Kitab girl Allah allows me to marry? No. Unless she doesn't have a priest, a sheikh, meaning her priest, she doesn't have a sheikh, she's not going to church every Sunday, she's not chaste, she doesn't believe in the morals the Bible tells her to establish, how is she a person of Ahlul Kitab? She's not Ahlul Kitab, she's just a secular lady. Everybody will say, yeah, okay, I believe in God. I guess there is. But if you don't believe in your book, you're not Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab means you believe in your book. It means you go to the church. <coughs> so for me, it's a double sin. Number one, you're disobeying the commandment of Allah and misusing the commandment of Allah to marry the person of the book. Now, if you already did it and you didn't know what I just said, that's different. Okay? But I'm saying for the young crowd, that you need to look to get married to Muslim girls. Because I have seen so many issues that pop up. I mean, I can do a whole lecture on just people that have come to me after being married and after having, you know what happens? Okay, fine, I'll, this is a long conversation, but this is what happens, okay? I've been married for 10 years. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example of a lady, Muslim lady who married a non-Muslim 
man. And the same thing is true about a Muslim man who married a non-Muslim what? Lady. Now, number one, for every marriage, there's a chance of a divorce, right? Okay. So just remember this. Now, a lady calls me up and says, you know, I love my husband and I married him and everything was cool and everything was great, but now we have three children and I want to take him to the masjid. I want to take the kids to the masjid and he wants to take them to the church. Do you think that will happen? Yes. Lord, Dr. L Laura Leschlinger has written a whole book on this. She's a Jewish lady and she's telling Jewish people in this book of hers that do not do interfaith marriages because when you have children, you're going to most likely lose your children. And then what do the parents decide? Okay, you will go into the church on Sundays and you'll go to the masjid on Fridays, some, some arrangement like that, and the kids, they're just even more confused. So you marry somebody outside your faith, you're putting your next generation and the generation after that, the whole on risk. And it's not worth the risk for people that care. And then of course, if they get divorced, that's a whole mess because it's very, very rare for a divorce to end positively. Very rare. And when it goes to the court system, the, generally what I've seen is the kids either get traumatized or negatively affected and they don't want to have anything to do with religion. So don't marry a blonde white girl that never goes to church. Just marry a Muslim girl. Yes? From your experience seeing different communities, do you think the Muslims can facilitate something? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we should, you know, once a year or twice a year or every three months, there should be kind of like some sort of system where the parents bring in their daughters and their sons and they have some sort of application and the parents meet each other and the children also can meet each other at a certain point. There has to be somebody like you has to sit down and formulate the filtering system of how that would work. And uh, there has to be some sort of understanding that in the end, you it's not the masjid that's going to decide, right? It's the parents that are going to decide and they have to take that responsibility. Or the children are going to decide and they're going to take that responsibility. But I do think the massages should facilitate marriages. Yes? So I know, is, there a, is there a program similar to this that is running successfully no. that we can No, no, but it's possible. ICNA does it once a year, and I don't know how successful they've been. Uh, if somebody knows about that, then they can share that in Shalom. Yes. I have a question about the parents. Uh, should the parents uh, keep a strict order in marrying their children? Like we have four kids. So we should. No, don't keep a strict order. No. No strict order. Oldest daughter is not married. Youngest daughter, uh, son got married. It's okay. It's taken as bad because we stigmatize it. We stigmatize it. Yeah, it's good. If it comes in order, it's good. Alhamdulillah. But if there's a clear opportunity to marry, like the other daughter, right? Like, what does the Quran say to Musa? Shuraib says, here's my daughters, marry any of them. Older, younger, it's fine. Sisters might have any questions? Yeah, sisters have any questions? If sisters have any questions, I'll take a few questions, I guess. Okay, um, okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, my question is, um, I, uh, you talk about the uh, interface based uh, marriage and uh, you say that the, the girl who married uh, and, uh, uh, the people of the book um, it is like a, a female Muslim marrying a non-Muslim male. Is a, it, it, it feels like that was something acceptable, but um, but I feel like um, it's a, it's a haram in, in uh, Islam to to marry a male that is not Muslim, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. A girl cannot marry a ahlul kitab, but a man can marry. A
guess I'll throw a question. Um, what are your thoughts on um, how families like suggesting to marry your own cousins or like relatives? And then what are your uh, what are also your thoughts on um, people marrying out of their Muslims but out of their race? <coughs> They're both difficult questions because of what we see statistically. Uh, marrying between your cousins. It's taboo, and a lot of times children grow up believing in these taboos. So a lot of times now, I'm talking about the U.S. U.S. grown kids will be like, she's my sister, I don't want to marry her. But if a cousin is okay to marry another cousin, and as long as it's not prolific, what do I mean by that? Our model, the loved one, he met a tribe. And he saw that they have some sort of genetic issue, or they were weak. And he said, What's, why are you guys all so weak? He said, we always intermarry, we always intermarry. Ormel said, don't do that. So that was the jihad of Omar Rabi Allah. So it's okay within Sharia to marry uh, within your cousins, but if it becomes too rampant, it's going to be negative. Number one. Number two, um, marry outside your race. It has positive aspects and it has negative aspects. First of all, anyone that grows up in America, they're more American than they're anything else. They're more American than they're Egyptian. They're more American than they're Pakistani. They're more American than they're Bengali. They're more American than any other race. So in that sense, they all share the same culture. Okay. Now, it becomes more complicated if you're here and the guy or the girl is coming from there meaning from Pakistan or from Egypt or something like this, it becomes more complicated. My experience is that those marriages generally can run into big problems. Because why? When you're raised in Pakistan, your image of marriage is different than the girl that's over here. She has a different expectation. She thinks I'm going to grow up and have my job, have my autonomy, and so on and so forth. By the way, I'll mention this since I'm talking about this issue. One of the biggest uh, you can say litmus tests of how close a relationship is, is to ask the question, do you share a joint account? And how honest are you with each other in money issues? How honest you're what? With each other in what? Money issues. If you're not completely honest in money issues with each other, that means that the relationship needs to do some work. Right? Because there's trust issues. Money has a lot of trust and power issues interrelated with it. But what I'm trying to say, I'm saying that if a girl is in America and she marries a Pakistani boy, right? He's going to be a doctor or whatever. And he comes here. He has a different image of a wife. She has a different image of being a wife and a different image of a husband. And there's a high chance now that they're running into a conflict. And one of, what's the biggest reason for divorce in America? Who knows? Finances. And the husband's going to be like, no, I'm going to control the finances. And you put everything here. And she's going to be like, no, I want my own account. And I want to have everything separate. And the trust starts to evade. And then she picks that up. <laughs> Any other questions? Three, four questions? Okay, well, just yeah. yes. yeah, well, um, First of all, thank you for uh, giving us such a, a great insight and a lot of enlightenment. Uh, my question is that we have so far heard about the marriage and about the, the boy and the girl and more of the religion and all the aspects are covered. What about the parents, like some of us who are really caring the religion, the religion pre pressure, the society pressure, the immediate family pressures. There are so many pressures on the parents um, who have uh, migrated, more likely trying to keep a balance between, uh, you know, our cultures and then the system running here. That is kind of a very high, very high maintenance. It's a, it's a hard balance. So any uh, advice how to uh, face such scenarios if the kids are going through a lot of you know, diversity issues here, facing up and want to get um, 
you know, we just talked about the marriages, how out of um, religion and all. So the parents, how would you advise to handle situations? The most important thing is to have a human-to-human -human relationship. The Quranic concept of families, let me share this with you. Maybe this will kind of answer the question from a different angle. You all know the dua in the Quran, Rabbana, Habdana min azwajina wa kuriyatina kurrata a'ayun, uja'anna lil muttaqina imam. O Allah, make my wives and my children into the apple of my eye. This dua every parent should say. Number two, the Islamic concept of entertainment is spending time with family. It's not sitting in front of TV. The Islamic concept of, see, the stress that you're talking about needs to be balanced by quality time of seeing your children playing and seeing your children interacting in a fun way outside the stress. Eating together, enjoying together, playing cards together, talking together, watching a movie together. But you need to have quality family time. Yeah. Outside the stress, yes. We have another question, sisters. Um, how involved should parents be when it comes to two people talking for the sake of marriage? Is it wrong for parents to reject proposals without asking their children first? It depends upon the relationship. If your child trusts you, then reject 100 relationships. If your child doesn't trust you, and you see that my child doesn't trust me, over here I'll make a point that remember how Yaqub knew and understood how the other brothers are jealous of who? So he, he understood his kids. Most parents wouldn't even see that one child is jealous from another child. And so the Having your pulse on your children and understanding that if I make a bilateral, if I make a unilateral decision uh, without asking my children how they'll react, this is on the parent to know their children so that, but the general rule is what? Is to take shura. Is to take it. it, it, uh, it. And the other thing I'll say to the parents, it's very important. Start talking about marriage now. So it's not like a big surprise when it happens. You already, okay, when you, have, when you find somebody you like, will you tell us? Try to assure them that you'll give them a process and a fair chance, right? That if you like somebody, tell me, and we'll go to their parents, and we'll, you know, unless it's, you explain to your child that unless it's very bad, I'm not gonna say no, this is your life. You make the choices. This is your life. Right? You, you, you have to you have to role play the possibility of proposal before it comes, so that when it does come, that that boy or that girl has in their mind, okay, this is what my parents are kind of going to do. Right? There was a time where you know mothers would ask their uh, sons, "What type of girl do you like?" I'll start looking because then there's a certain anticipation. Okay, if I tell my mom that I like this boy, and you've already told your daughter, if you like a boy, tell me. I'm totally open to it. That attitude is better than uh, than a harsh attitude. Let's put it that way, right? Because if she tells you, the best thing you can have in your life is your children that come and tell you that their problems. You know, Yusuf salam, when he had that dream, remember? He came to his dad. He didn't have to go to his dad, he could have gone to his brothers. But he goes to his dad, he says, Ya Abati, oh my dad. In your ayatu ahada ashafoka ma wa shamsa wa al-qama wa ayatu hum. And then he says it again, wa ayatu hum li sajidi. I saw them, I saw them bow down to me. How can these things be bowing down to me? Right? So he had this open relationship with his dad. You have to have an open relationship with your kids. You have to trust that Allah will allow them to make the right decisions. You cannot make decisions for them. 
This was supposed to be about marriage. But, okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so when you do like what questions should you ask? Them? Oh, that's a whole. Or it's a very long conversation about what questions to ask. When like premarital counseling or premarital marriage club questions, there this is a very because people do not ask the right questions. People do not ninety nine percent of the time people do not ask the right questions. People don't ask the right questions, and that's a whole conversation in itself. You know? Do you provide premarital counseling? Yes. Like these, these questions for children to come in? Yeah, I mean, if anyone wants premarital counseling, just contact my wife. She's somewhere in the audience, I think. Hello, Ms. Samuela. Okay, we're good, inshallah. Thank you, everyone. You were a great audience. Takbir! for your advice and for your lecture and for your Q&A session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. I hope you all benefited from these sessions, inshallah. Um, at this point,